it's uh, really a, a pleasure to see. Uh, tonight we're celebrating color. We're celebrating not only color in design, but also in, in, in fashion. Look at, look at all the panelists here. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So um, I'm Anton, and here is Rita. We are the directors of Kaelin. And this is really a great uh, time where we could actually celebrate this beautiful collaboration between Kaelin and Taubman's. And this is really the first in the world, and never happened before, where two manufacturers of this level in terms of porcelain and paint collaborated on, on actually an, on a collection together. So when we talk about color, we obviously know paint are the ones that know color the most. So we, we love to collaborate with them. And we made beautiful eight uh, tiles, eight looks, based on Tobman's color forecast for 2024. Um, and obviously, Fiona and Jason will be will be explaining it um, later. Let me find my clicker so I could actually go through the presentation. Thank you, I found it. So, <laughs> obviously, uh, one of the greatest parts of tonight is the panel talk because we want everyone to encourage to, to use color. Uh, Kaylin is always all about color, so it's just Stobmans, but actually we have a really a superstar panel uh, tonight that will be able to, to introduce color and, and, and how to use it, I guess. So we have obviously James Treble, who is the moderator tonight, an interior design and TV presenter. Such an honor to have it. We have Fiona Dawson from Taubman's. <laughs> we have Jason Mifsud from Kaylin. <laughs> we have Sarah Jane Pike from Arrington <laughs> Pike. We have Daniela Trippett from uh, Casabella. She, she styled this beautiful venue. And obviously, we have Dr. Scott Skipworth from Billy Blue College of Design. <laughs> So, I will pass to James, he's the, he's the moderator tonight, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, moderator, I've been called much worse, how are you all? <laughs> now you either came through the tunnel, which was delightful, or Roselle Tunnel, or wherever you've been coming from. Great to see you all, having a chat with some familiar faces here, and a great panel here, hello everyone. Um, the last two days in particular, we've looked to the sky, all I've seen is, um, tones and shades for all of us colour experts. Not much tint, lots of black and lots of grey, so we definitely need uh, colour in our lives. I saw my friend Fern over there, I think you're wearing the sky that we were looking for, honey, on that dress today. Colour. Colour is so important to all of us and uh, I was very interestingly listening to a podcast in the car only a few days ago. It was actually an American podcast talking about the, um, the sort of the the bland colour schemes that have been introduced mainly through, they think, the real estate industry being driven to be very clean and clinical and whites and greys and something that's going to sell to the, I love when you're all nodding straight away. We all get it and we understand the commerciality of what we create as spaces that people live and work in. But colour is so important. I think when you look back to the 50s and there was chequered floors on kitchens and pastel colours and matching appliances and the most amazing without saying a brand, for mica bench tops with, you know, metal trims. Where's all that colour gone? We sort of went into the 80s and it was a bit beigey and greeny and into 90s and then we've got greyish. I love this. I remember ask, asking to write an article about uh, Japandi and I thought, wow, where are we going? But greyish uh, is something we all know. So I'm going to throw over to each of our experts here. We've got an interesting panel and I was quite excited to be part of this event, not only because I have been in this beautiful showroom before and we are sport for choice of colours and how they're reimagined in so many natural stones and look, but of course with Torbman's being forecasting, um, I've got Torbman's on my little renovation, an amazing new colour. Um, and I think it's important to realise how colour is infiltrated into the design industry. We've got experts here who use it commercially, residentially, who understand products through tiles, who teach it to the next generation and who use colour 
beautifully to elevate properties and style them for sale. So I think it's a very interesting lineup covering a, a broad sort of spectrum of ways to color. To kick things off, I'd like to, um, you could almost be my Adriana Xenides. You look like you, you should be, you're stunning tonight. Fiona, you look like you should be turning around a consonant or a vowel. What do you think? <laughs> Very good. Now, I've known Fiona for a little while and she's passionate about colour. For those of you who haven't seen it, she does run a podcast where she shares knowledge constantly. It's, oh, it's every week that you run it now, isn't it? I, Amazing. I am every week, yeah. Crazy. Um, sharing the knowledge and I've been part of that podcast as well. I'm going to pass over to you now to give us an insight to 2024. What's coming, where we think colours are evolving and how you've interpreted that with the Taubman's palette. Over to you. Thank you. I thought I was here to sing karaoke, but I'm happy to talk colour. She can okay. sing. <laughs> okay, so I'm really excited to be here and it's wonderful to be in this amazing, amazing showroom. It is divine. And firstly, before I kick off, I really want to thank Anton and Rita. This is an amazing opportunity for us here tonight, um, Torbens, to be um, myself representing Torbens and to have been able to work with you and work with Jason here on um, developing some amazing, beautiful tiles. Um, it's been fabulous and what a journey. So we'll talk about that soon. But so the 2024 colour forecast is titled Equilibrium. So it's all about creating your perfect state of balance. And I think we've done that really well with what we've done together. Um, we, when we forecast colours, we look um, internationally because I work for Torbman's, which is a company um, owned by PPG. So PPG is a big global company and we have the most amazing products that are designed to protect and beautify your space. So um, I'm looking at um, what's happening globally when we're looking at colours, but we're also looking at how we can interpret that for the Australian market. So as I said, it's called Equilibrium. There are four colour palettes that... Um, sort of, you know, capture that if you like. We've got Euphoric, which are bolder, brighter colours that um, pay homage to, I'm going to completely lose what I'm going to say now, maximalism. So it's all about, maximalism is, you know, injecting wonderful, bright, bold patterns and colour. Um, then we've got Grounded. Grounded plays to um, biophilia design. So looking at what's happening outside, bringing the outdoors in. When we're looking at beautiful greens and blues, and we really know that um, what I'm seeing is green is becoming the new neutral or one of the new neutrals. And then um, composure, which are softer colours that have sort of drawn inspiration from neotenic design. So they all sort of um, sit on the edge of neutrality again. And then we've got centred, which is all around whites. Um, and bringing in that beautiful modern Mediterranean aesthetic where we're starting to see warmer whites sort of come to life. So that's what sort of captures equilibrium. Um, that's the forecast. That's it. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> what? I love succinct. We want that. Drinks all around. <laughs> Fiona, as I look up there, I mean, we are in a world where we sort of, you're, you're talking to a room of professionals, yep. a, a room of people who are doing this. Most of us are in the design industry or field of some way, um, dealing with clients and dealing with product. And of course, we need to be aware of that commercialization of the spaces. We need our beautiful artworks, our creative spaces yes. to sell, Correct. to meet the client brief, but also to inspire and create beautiful spaces we are in. As I'm looking through with the color palette, and I have had a little um, sneak peek, so I was spoiled. Um, a very calming palette, really muted tones. You can yeah. definitely see that colorway coming through, almost like the, some of the green tones and those earthy tones are like sort of aged, worn succulents, the yes. colour that you get outside when they've been, you know, sun-kissed. It's interesting being a national, a global brand that then you're creating product for Australian market to understand the Australian voice. I'm wondering, um, Tilt, it wasn't me, that was great. Um, <laughs> I've been doing it lately, it's been a big year everyone. Um, when you're looking for the colour palette, uh, we don't have to go far to think of the ochres of, of Earth, um, of the you know, Australian Earth. Um, for our Indigenous um, Aboriginals, you know, I'm sorry if I, that word offends, but it's a word that I use. Um, the Indigenous communities being able to really understand how to unlock that colour in their own artworks and create everything from the ground. But you can see that 
in the in the colour palette. You can. There's lots of beauty. Oh, sorry, there's lots of beautiful, rich, earthy tones, and then sort of greens that are, are more earthy and grounded, as that collection says. It's grounded mm. um, and look very adaptable and easy to use within our spaces. And I really think you know with like things like colour drenching becoming something that's amazing, like having all surfaces, you know, sort of in the same colour. This is where your wonderful collection of the paint tile collection comes into play. Um, you know, we've got some fantastic, I don't want to take away from what you're about to talk about, but for example, like the nut, which is the most beautiful, rich, warm, earthy tone, you know, pairing that with um, your tile, it's just fantastic. So yeah, we've sort of accommodated, we've tried to make it um, lovable by everyone, if you like. Mm. And really low chroma, like they're quite obviously calming. I mean, we don't have to think back too far. Um, I was in the shopping centre, I ran in and out today and there was everyone wearing masks. So I'm going, what are you doing? Take them off. But people are still concerned and we were, were locked inside. We were realising, for a lot of us, it, was yes. a, it meant a lot of work, didn't it? People were stuck in homes going, God, my house is ugly, I need to renovate it or knock it down. And we haven't stopped working since, yay. Um, so also how to bring the outside in with colours that are calming. It, it is quite low in chroma. There's not these bold Lego colours, if you like, right. really calming. A little hint of a mustardy sort of yeah. a yellow there, a little yeah. bit almost a sort of a centipede. It's like some colours that you'd find in the Indian spice market, I suppose. Yes. Perfect for Australian market. But also too, market. you know, those, those sort of pinky sort of muted pink slash sort of, I hate to say it, but beigey sort of tone, mm. you know, like extracting that out of, so a sunset or something like that. Like, so you could say like the overarching theme for Equilibrium is all about biophilia or biophilic design, bringing that outdoors in. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, and you look beautiful in the pink that you've chosen Thank tonight. You. Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> Sandro, I'm sorry if that offends someone. I was emceeing an event down in Melbourne and I had a lady let me know that some things I was saying was misogynistic because I've complimented a lady who had won an architectural award on how she looked. And so I got and I said, look, I'm really sorry to all the men in the room. You look beautiful and stunning and you're very talented as well. So um, the colour is important. It's a nice soft pink. And Sandro is really happy to see some of these tones because he does not like the word blush. Um, and it's really interesting, my partner Sandro Nocentini, who's in the room, is an artist. And he, interestingly, Roman born, sees green as a primary. Yeah. It's very interesting to understand how colours viewed differently by different creatives. So as an artisan, to see green as a primary is quite funny. We have, you know, arguments over a glass of wine. It's good to do. <laughs> Jason, Hello. how are you? Good, thank you. Very good. Looking very suave. Thank you. Um, I have the... Um, Privy, I didn't go this year. I had really was upset about it. We were undertaking a little renovation and lots of work on. But normally I go to Bologna for the tile fair. It's a place that you have to go if you haven't been. It's a dreadful city to visit. Home of Tortellini and Mortadella and balsamic vinegar. Oh my gosh. But the International Tile Fair, to see what's happening in tiles and to see how it's interpreted for the Australian market, you put together such an amazing range of tiles here at Kaylin, like beautiful tiles. They're, they're like works of art. Some of them could just be hung on the wall as one tile, many of them. Um, little hints with um, deco and beautiful, you know, prints that are really re um, creating, recreating um, it, nature in a different form. How have you interpreted it into the world of tiles and brought this colour through? I guess as manufacturers on a world market level, um, our design teams are consistently looking at trends that are forecasting through the world market. And on the Australian market, we almost find it our responsibility to bring the ability for design teams on the Australian market to be able to inject colour and beautiful designs such as our integrated panels behind us in the studio today to the Australian market. Um, just in the GSI fair this year, Rita and Anton quickly noticed that um, textures and movement and organics um, were very well pronounced throughout the GSI fair and for the first time at the design fair we found that the Australian market was very aligned to what was happening on an international level. So we found that quite interesting and, and funnily enough prior to the fair coming to fruition um, we actually injected our newly developed Australian organics range onto the Australian market which consists of fabrics and textural components and um, this year um, in, internationally, we're finding that the trend um, is all about texture 
and movement and being able to visually see that through the tile surface. So I guess there's a great representation of that through our studio. Um, visiting the fair myself, it's interesting because it, if you haven't been, you really should put it on the radar. Many designers go to Milan. Of course, Milan is an amazing space to visit. Everyone's striking. For all of you girls uh, in the room and men of my persuasion, um, you go to the tile fair. It's Lots amazing. of fellas looking pretty smart there in Italy. <laughs> Outstanding. It's like going to Flemington Markets on steroids. It is similar in size to Milan. It's huge. It's amazing. But it's amazing to see because the work that goes into creating tiles in particular is not... If you go to Milan, maybe... Hello, John. Maybe if you go to Milan, you can see a sofa that's been upholstered last night and put on the stand the night before. Fabric can be preconceived but thought of and, and turned around relatively quickly. So Tiles so have chemical reactions, the glazes have exactly. to work. Exactly. It's a much longer timeline to be trend forecasting, if you like. Most definitely. The, the manufacturing process, there's a lot of back and forth. Um, when the resins actually go into the kiln, they're actually clear. So we actually don't know what the end result's going to be until it's out of firing. So especially with this Torbens range that we've developed through Torbens with the um, colour forecast this year, there was a lot of back and forth. And when you talk paint, there's pigments and there's tones and there's all these moving variables, I guess, on a paint level. But to be able to transition that into a tile format, it, it definitely was a hard, a hard task. But... Um, I think, I think we did all right. <laughs> yes, most definitely. Um, now, without doing a plug, if you haven't used the product, but I've used this product, Colorsmith Tool from Torbens is able to scan and create colours, and we created our own colours uh, on our own renovation, which was actually a lot of fun, scanning like Converse shoes and a backpack and um, the bottom of a terracotta pot, and the results are amazing. How do you go then creating, understanding that chemical reaction, which can really alter shades and tones within the same colour to represent. As I'm looking up there, I can also see why Fiona loves that nutmeg is beautiful. It's a stunning colour. Yeah, it's stunning. Mm. Well, look, I think it becomes where we become reliant on, on our design teams and our manufacturing teams. I mean, you take this collaboration in for an example, it, it all started with a conversation, the conversation between myself and Fiona, and then obviously that transition to business owners, Rita and Anton. And then from there, with the ability as manufacturers on a world market perspective, we were able to create and develop this and, and, and place it onto the Australian market. So I think, in short, it's, it's, um, it's being reliant on your team. And, and, you know, we have some of the best development manufacturers I in the world within our uh, manufacturing plant. We have some of the top design um, development uh, personnel as well. So, Ooh. yeah, I, I would say, in short, being, being reliant on your team and, and we're lucky to have some of the best people in that team. You also come from a, a furniture and product development background. I've done a little bit of research. I checked you out. Thank you. <laughs> in a very professional way. Um, so obviously the understanding of that process leads into what you're able to do with Kaylin because it is a lengthy process to create works that are specific and, and you, you're sort of reinventing all the time. Look, look to, to, to not sound... Okay, don't take this the wrong way, but in <laughs> relation late. to product development, it's actually an easy process. In relation to the team that we have in our manufacturing um, plant internationally, they're very versed on the development process and, you know, generally we can transfer a product such as paint into an actual physical product um, within a few weeks. But in this instance, it became a bit of an obstacle because we were dealing with actual tones and forecasted colours that through that firing process we had to align with and we had to get correct. Um, so yeah, so, but most definitely when it comes to new development of product, um, the design files are quite intense um, and they can be developed over a 12 month period, most definitely, yeah. I remember watching, I forget her no first name, some of you may know, but a um, very elegant lady who created the Huffington Post. I remember watching an interview of her, it's probably about 15 years ago, and she spoke about the future being the strength of collaboration. And most you definitely. have to see most how definitely. brands collide, you know, and I'm twin, so I'm, I have no choice in it. I've been collaborating since I was born. Um, people got, didn't realise that there's two of me. But um, I think the strength in numbers and being able to align yourself is very strong. So it's, it's, it's great for both of the brands to interpret your work. 
Well, look, to be able to bring paint into a hard surface, um, to have the ability to not only utilise paint for wall applications or cabinetry, for instance, to how we traditionally utilise paint, but to now be able to transition that to floor and wall applications all the way down to our newly developed integrated vanity, which is in our first cubicle. Um, next year, it will be the first sustainable integrated porcelain vanity on the Australian market, which you can now develop, I guess, and design up to 4,000 different finishes. I mean, it's crazy. Up to 4,000. Up to 4,000. You had to stop it I mean, somewhere. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling, <laughs> right? Um, but, but it's like anything. It's, it's getting to know who you're working with. It's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's almost having a collaboration individually with design firms. And it's, uh, once you understand our potential and our ability, I think things transition very quickly. And it's the same, I think, with Taubman's. Um, you know, they, th there is that opportunity to develop um, bespoke paints through PPG um, and put your name to it. So it's just about having conversations, really. And we can match. Excuse me. We'll it, uh, I think I'm back. Are you back? No. Oh. No, she's off. I'm off. <laughs> Collaboration, guys. <laughs> we can create the most wonderful paint colours to go with your tiles. And if you're wanting to, you know, create a fantastic tile to elevate your brand and then have colours to align with that. We can collaborate together and we can do that. That's the power of collaboration. Yeah. 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 Um, Daniela, how are you? Hi. <laughs> we met many years ago. I know. It was so a crazy nice. party <laughs> night. It was wonderful. We have some talented friends in between us both. How are you? I'm very good. What's great about your bio when I get to read, apart from the talent that you have, the work that you create, the ability to transform spaces and you're a busy mum, is that it speaks about you being a butterfly who just loves to be at social <laughs> events. But obviously you, you look stunning. Great to have you here. How are you? Thank you. How are you? Very good. I think that it's something that we understand in Australia. We buy and sell real estate here possibly more than any country around the world. Yes. It's interesting for me having an Italian partner from Rome where you buy an apartment or a house that doesn't have a kitchen in it because they take I, it with them. I know. Utterly weird. Um, is the same. <laughs> amazing. Um, the ability to transform and present property has a huge impact on its value. Um, I started life as a real estate agent before I realised that I was just far too honest and <laughs> loved design and did a huge arc something like 25 years ago. The ability to transform property can add value yeah, of about 13 to 15% on top of a house when it's styled. Yes. It's quite amazing it's if you lot, don't yeah. know that figure. The ability for you to be able to transform a property has a lot to do with placement, scale, texture, but of course, colour. Mm -hmm. Colour would be primary. Tell us about what you do and how you do it and how you use colour as a powerful tool. It's funny though, because I love colour and I often get asked to do styling for places that people that like colour. Um, I feel like when I started property styling, it was, everything was so black and white and so neutral and, and people used to say, oh, this is different, who done this, who done that, you know, because there was a green couch, there was a pink couch, there was something interesting to look at it. And now I get called for jobs, literally, because they wanted me to do color. And I do a lot of prop around this, you know, as in a city, they small, they tiny, and it's challenging because you need to be very careful not to overpower and very careful how you're gonna use and how to create places that people are gonna walk in and feel excited about and that's gonna reflect on the result of the, the sale for sure. So I feel like it's easy for me to, to comfortably say that uh, the color really affects your mood, the way you feel, it transports you to places. It's just have the uh, feeling, that sentimental, that psychology of color. So I think it's easy for me to say that. I mean, I've been uh, not only honored to be invited to the panel, but to ask to be styling or the event and all the cubics and, and, and it was amazing to find amazing collaborators. I collaborated with Gob West, with l and um, Art House & Co, Sydney Mirrors, few of my suppliers in here and, and it was so easy to kind of go and shop and find the all the colours that I need for it. But even like saying putting together and how the colour work, it, it is an art and I think it's hard um, you can't just say you can do colour everywhere. You, need to, you can use colour in walls, in furniture, in 
uh, rug, um, artwork, cushions, there's so many ways, flowers, you know, you see everywhere that I use color in different ways here. And what I love so much about color, it is you can take it, there's so many hues and tones. Some people go, I, I, like I'm, I'm, personally I hate purple. I'm not <laughs> purple person. But I can probably deal with a lavender, <laughs> you know, it's a bit softer. Uh, and when I look at the, the color forecast for 2024, I can see how things are a bit softer and it's like easier to sell. Yeah, you can do that color, can you? Like it's, it, because we still have that challenge, I must say. Some people really forward for color, but not so many. There are still people like afraid. Oh, can I live with that every day? And it's amazing how sometimes when I have clients that really trust the process and let me work through the magic, and they go in the end, oh, oh my God, this really work. You know, you really made this amazing, you know? And, and I think that's, I always tell my clients, you know, obviously tell me the color that you can't live with. <laughs> tell me the color you love. And then we work through that and how we're gonna create this. Look at your wardrobe. What, are the, what, what is in your wardrobe? What do you love, you know? Pick it up that beautiful blouse or dress, throw in the chair and see how you're gonna feel about living there every day, you know? Because that's it, you need to get used to and just not be so overwhelmed. You just have to have one hero and then work the pieces around that hero in that room. And I think when you work with the whole concept in the house, and it's become a palette, you know. I often do rooms in different colors, different way, but when they, you look at them as, as a collection, they kind of work together. Because it, well, there's a transition between one room to the other, but you don't need to do everything the same. Because color does affect the way you, the, the way you feel that you're living. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm from Brazil and I'm really used to color. Grow up with color. Everything is so colorful. And I feel like people there are so happy. There's so much poverty. There's so many people have nothing, but they're still laughing. They're still dancing. They're still yeah. drinking. I feel like it's just because the amount of color we have every day. You know, just it's a really <laughs> valid and interesting point that you make, isn't it? The impact of color waking up. I'm sure if you wake up and it's just... It's white and white and white, well, or if it's grey. You grayish. talk about the greys, like the two days that we had all these tones. Mm. And, you know, it affects how you feel. Like it's different when you wake up and it's nice and sunny and bright and yeah, blue. Of you know? it just when you're working with, I'm going to ask one question first. I want to ask the difference between when you're uh, creating a space and using colour to highlight it to sell, because it is a different journey to then dealing with a client. Do you talk about client colours that they don't like? It's funny, you don't like purple. I used to wear a lot of it. I used to wear so much orange. My mother asked me if I was going to be a Rajneeshi when I was 21 and I said, no, I just like orange. Um, the colours change. We change how we use colour. I wonder in the time that you've been doing this, did you notice the, the driving force of colour from clients' points of view? I do change like after COVID? Did you notice I a noticed, change? I definitely noticed that just because I feel like because people are so stuck and it was their way to bring the outside in. When you look at landscape, what we're surrounded by, it, that's in your main inspiration. Like, I mean, my main inspiration for my projects or for my design often come from nature, from what I see on outside, you know, this there's so much beauty out there, you know. And that's what I say, color can take you to places. Um, this, like I love travel and, and when I go to places, I really pay attention to the landscape of what's around me, you know, and what normally those colors is going to be a representation of that specific city or that country and then, you know, that brings me memory. Mm. So I feel like that's the connection the color can bring, that, that sentimental side. Australia has such different light. Sometimes I think when I remember studying color and before interiors, um, Bauhaus and such strong, bold um, primaries that work so well. I love that you're nodding up there, Sarah. Um, the, 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 the strong colours were so bold and worked really well in Germany and in Europe where the sky is darker. And in Australia, you know, you drive yeah. and get something to eat and you think you're going and to Red can. Rooster, but it's actually pink because it's bleached out from our sun. So the colour drive here is very different to a Brazilian colour. Did you notice that when you came? I did, I did. did you, I mean, I live in a town, I'm from Brasilia City, the capital, which there's no, there's no beaches. But we had this really plain um, sky, the sky used to be beautiful. And I, used, I remember having the most beautiful sunset, maybe that's why I'm so, love sunset, that's my favorite part of the day. 
And I always pay attention how the sun works in different places in the world. And I love the sunsets here, how it can, like the pink ones here, it's my favorite, you know. And I feel like that it, it does have an effect. When I came here, like all, being close to water, it's another whole level too, you know. But it, I, just, I just feel like that... Impacts colour. Impacts, yeah, definitely, yeah. When designing and using colour for sale, mm. you're highlighting the benefits of the architecture. I suppose you have to watch that you don't make a big room feel small yes, or yes. Um, how, how do you use colour in a way to, to I think that's, change I mean, the space? I need to pay attention. Show it its best. Obviously, uh, scale of the furniture that I use, especially for this small place and stuff. But I try to create, have a colour for different rooms and make sure they work as a collection. So it's not so overpowering. It might be the rug that I choose or the colour of the lounge. And then I normally have a hero piece on each room and then I drive uh, the rest according to there. It might be a piece of art or a cushion that I love for that specific house. But I pay attention on the owners, uh, obviously the market, to try to understand who is going to buy, who is going to be your client. I, I, I think maybe because I have that background not only in interior but in marketing as well, I try to really educate my vendors on who could be your potential buyer and what they could looking for, you know. I say, you're, I'll get called for sometimes for like partial jobs, my worst nightmare, but you know, I normally- Partial jobs, your worst, because you've got to work with some I things that are something there. Something that I go, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that lounge, really. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, and, and, and that's my worst enemy. But, but it, it's funny though, maybe because I have to put so much work into it, probably get paid less because they think they're going to save money by doing partial. But I, I always say, I actually, there's not much difference for me in price because I'm going to spend a lot more time trying to work with what you have and trying to make things work for you in a better way. And even like saying to people how, people are going to come into your house and they're going to, I, I, like I wouldn't be doing that, but there are people that will be doing open cupboards checking things, you know. So you need, you need to pay attention to so many details because you're going to open your house, but create that dream. You know, you don't live like that every day. Who does? They're like everything's so tidy. You're telling a, you're telling a story, yeah, aren't you? That might, yeah, might not be real. There's no dirty footy socks no. in the corner of the bedroom and, and I, your children will do their homework and their bedrooms will be clean. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My life. <laughs> but yeah, so you're selling a story, selling a dream. And I say, I know it's going to be high, special for the partial people. They're going to be living there. Oh, mm. I was like, oh, I feel for you. But, you know. <laughs> a lot of the colour palette that's been created as part of Equilibrium and then reinterpreted in tiles with kale and you've, you can see that calmness oh, in the I colours. I presume that that has an influence on how you use colour in your space mm. as well, that calming tone. Are there colours or tones? You mentioned you don't personally like purple. It is a polarising colour too. Yeah. Is there colours that you don't? use when you're creating properties, like I styling properties purple. to sell? I don't use purple. You don't use purple? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I do use purple. I don't, I don't think I have. Maybe in a flower, maybe. I don't know. I helped my mother-in-law because she loves purple and she was maybe like... Maybe that's why. She was like, <laughs> oh, do you like this? It's all not my mm. colour, but it work in your bedroom. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I know she loves it. <laughs> I remember working with clients many, many years ago and they had a son, he came along for selections in a tile shop, funny enough, and it was, it was like, he, this guy's off his face, he's like four, he's going to run, he doesn't stop. And she said he just loves red. He oh. loves red, he loves Speedy from, what's the race car movie, you know, out in the, what's the, there's the cars. And I said, mm, I think red's the problem. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's put red in this child's room. It's amazing the emotive power of colour. Like, let's not do that. Especially, yeah. oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> go to sleep. N neutral city, <laughs> give him a bedroom full of nutmeg and calm yeah. him down. Oh. Sarah Jane Pike, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Elegantly up the end there. I've got to share something with you. I had a little chat with Sarah Jane. I don't know about you, but um, I was utterly in shock at how old Arnhem Pike is. I felt like you guys have been around a lot longer and then you said, it feels like it too. How long is Arnhem Pike? It feels like a long time, 16 years. It's 16 since years. Since started the business, 2007, so it does feel like a long time. It's evolved a lot, it's changed a lot over that time, so I think it stays fresh, but yeah, it feels like a long time to us too. From the outside watching, I followed from the sidelines and watch you, you, you have 
develop such a strong design voice. You have a reputation for the work that you create. It's not patronising you, we all know this. You create beautiful spaces. I'm wondering, going back to how I sort of spoke at the beginning with that idea of creating spaces, commercial and residential and in that zone, where it's so easy to tick the brief in a very safe way that's commercial. Um, we have lots of beautiful timber tones. We have natural stones you can see in the tiles here and in furniture. Um, how do you approach that and how do you use colour? Um, colour, I think, was one of the things that united Juliet and I at the very beginning of the business. We used to talk about her bedroom, which was sunshine yellow growing up, and I had a particular wallpaper and I could remember exactly the pattern of that wallpaper and tracing it over and over as a kid lying in my bed. And we just had really formative, strong, emotive connection to colour, both of us. And I think, you know, in that kind of first decade over the 2000s, there was a very, very white aesthetic coming through design, particularly in Sydney and in Australia. And we decided that we would like to try something different. And what that meant was that for a long time, we were convincing people of things that felt very scary, frightening, difficult for them. Um, and we were just sort of clever with the fact that we'd only put the colourful things out there and just see if we could bring more of those people to us and more people who were on board and understood what it was we were trying to do. And so we were able to build, I guess, like Danny, a reputation for colour and people coming to us to say, I want that, I don't know what it is, I don't know how to do it, I'm, I'm actually a bit scared but I know I want it. And um, you know, we always approach colour with people about what brings you joy. My favourite thing, we never photograph the laundries, but my favourite is the laundry because in the laundry you can just do whatever makes you happy. We've done sky blue laundry. We've done the most beautiful parsley green laundry we just did. Um, if When it's my turn, I will have the sunshine yellow laundry. No one's asked for that yet. You can be the first. Um, so, and you know, we do some commercial spaces too, but I think just finding the delight in things, that joyful, unexpected delight in things is where, what makes us happy and we're just bringing that joy to other people. It's funny that you mentioned the laundry. I also spend a lot of time creating beautiful laundries. I think people underestimate, we all have to go there, somebody has to. I usually speak to the husband, you know that room where your clothes come out and they're all clean? That's called a laundry. <laughs> um, if you make it a beautiful space, it almost becomes an, a, a, a I'm not going to say everyone looks forward to washing clothes, but it changes the experience. Why not elevate this mundane task, which it's just part of the human condition. We don't choose it, we just have to do it. So why not elevate it into something that at least feels good? In that uh, transformation time, the business you, you know, went through the woes, most people in the room have some form of they've started a business or gone out on their own or work with a brand. It's a big journey to develop your design voice that you did together with trust and then you evolved. You test the market with the colours, as you said. Have you seen a big change in what the market is therefore um, demanding from you or expecting from you now? Absolutely. I think that the Australian market has got such a good sense now about richness and layering and materiality. And, you know, colour for us is absolutely paint and tile, and, but it's also art, it's furnishing, um, it's, all of, it's all of the elements combined. We're very big on colour combinations. We just love the way colours interact and intersect and, and make friends with each other. I often say, where's the friend? What's the friend in this? You know, this needs a friend. How do we make sort of beautiful little relationships in a space? And that's always going to be in that combination. It's going to be in the, in the alchemy of all the parts coming together. You can drink in the laundry too. We just heard the glass knocked over. <laughs> when you're developing your colour palette and starting to identify space, <coughs> I presume it's different if it's a job that you're taking from scratch that's being built or if it's an existing property. Um, you talked about being able to identify and create that sort of space within the space. Do you look for a continuous theme of a thread of colour to run through the home or do you play, create more playfulness and create different schemes or looks within different spaces? There's definitely the playfulness for us. I think the, it's, and again, it's not the friends, but it's just you want to see connection. You want to see some connection. And I think when you're designing for a client, 
the connection is them. So they will be present in all those spaces, whether there's a space where they're happy for it to be more dynamic and a space where they want it to be calmer and quieter and where we're talking about the different moods, they'll still be in all those spaces. So that will still be the connection throughout the scheme. It doesn't, you don't have to think too hard about it. I don't think it's a forced thing. It's quite an intuitive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, some of the projects that are up, we, we think about immersive colour. We think about really, we always talk about swimming in it. So, I'm, I, you know, in the bedroom, I just want to swim in it. I just want to lie in my bed and be like swathed in something gorgeous. And so for some people that is just the softest, softest pink. And for some people it's like a deep, beautiful green, you know, and it's very personal. But the person who picks the deep, beautiful green bedroom probably picks the really gorgeous, strong marble as well. You know, that, that's their personality and it's their comfort level. So it is going to be consistent in the house. Mm. For inspiration, we finally had a little chat. We were both in Egypt in 1996, I think it was. We were both in Egypt at exactly the same time. Because you were there too, because it was a, and it, there was a terrible shooting of a busload of people, and we were in the country, sort of stuck there. We, for Australians, we sometimes it's almost that tall poppy syndrome where I feel like we've come through it um, of needing to look outside so much for inspiration. <clears throat> And a lot of that comes from travelling within our country or overseas. I'm one of those people, I've looked, I've surfed your images and looked online to get motivation and inspiration for my own job, so I'm just letting you know. For you to do that, come on, you all have. For you, I'm wondering, obviously travelling I think is a natural part of that, but where do you search for inspiration? Do, do you and Julia go out and say, listen honey, you need to take your phone to the bathroom now and take a photo of that vanity it's outstanding or you know I think we all know as designers that it's an occupational hazard and that you have to check the bathroom everywhere you go and you can't go to any restaurant or hotel or anything and you're saying to your partner sorry I'm just going to check the bathroom and turn your phone on you've silent you've got to look at it you've got to have a look wherever you are and I think we talk about this with our team it's about being an intentional observer everywhere you are you are being inspired and you have to become a curator of the things that you see and you have to be thinking, gosh, this feels good, what is it? And then your brain just starts, you know, in the background and you're doing this, you're going ha, ha, to the conversation, but you're really going, what's happening with the lighting? Is it the lighting? Is it the noise? And I think that then you're just creating this mental catalogue. And we always say in our conceptual design phase, try not to go down the Pinterest hole, try not to be too image-based, try and go a little bit within when you're listening to a client, where, where, what can I draw on? What have I seen, been, felt that I can bring here? And the thing about travel, because I've thought about this a lot and we've had a lot, a lot less travel um, and we made an effort to go and see some local projects, um, a whole series of projects in Sydney recently with our team because we're like, we need to be inspired by the incredible design that's happening here. And the world is looking at us, the world is looking at Australian design and they like what they see and they're impressed by us. So we should be impressed by each other and be really into that as well. But the reason we get inspired when we travel, I think, is that we like who we are when we're there. You know, you like the version of yourself that's walking down the street in Santorini. So how can you bring that version of yourself into your house? It's not about having whitewashed walls necessarily. So it's what's, what version of you turns up on that trip and how you feel there is the thing you're actually trying to capture. I, we just had a slight discussion about it. I'm wondering about that turning point because it felt like things did change. We were stuck inside. We, we really had time. I remember being a kitchen designer 25 years ago and we always sold the most kitchens in February because everyone was stuck looking at their ugly kitchens over Christmas and that's when the sales would go through. So Christmas is one of those times we switch off but in COVID we switched off, all had to work from home, all stuck there. Did you find that that influenced clients that you were working with post that? Did you think they were more conservative, more ambitious, more open-minded? How, how did that work? I think the change we've seen is about looking for connection. So people are much more interested in being connected to their space and for your home to create connections for you. It's about who can come and see you, how your family feels there, what you're doing there. So I don't know if it changed people's aesthetic bravery, but I think the importance of the space just really made people much more interested in the dynamics, how it's going to work, how it's going to feel, um, and putting together something really considered and really intentional. 
Yeah, beautiful. I love the intentional. Dr. Scott, yes. how are you? Dr. Good. Scott. I don't know why I have to say it like that. <laughs> Dr. Sounds Scott. Good. I think you're the most qualified. You've got the most letters after your name on the panel. Maybe all of us together, we can match you. You have quite a varied um, background of love of, of design, of understanding space of knowledge internationally and in Australia. And now working at Billy Blue, you're shaking up the generation who have rocked in and probably haven't slept in there, yawning with their mouth open in class in front of you. Um, you know, the school does have a great reputation, so that's obviously down to the likes of yourself there who are teaching students. I have Billy Blue students come up to me all the time um, when I'm at an event or speaking. Okay. How do you interpret and explain the process? Because you have a really strong understanding of the history of colour. And what's interesting for us to be looking at what is new for next year, because there is a wave of colour changes, sometimes in furs, this is now in and that is not, and there's a wave of change of colours, but you look at that in a bigger scale historically. Can you talk to us about that? Um, well, it's really important for our students to engage with the trends now, and um, we'd love for our students to have you know, at least one project where they're exploring current color, um, you know, so for their portfolio. So when they go out to meet with potential employers, probably many of you here, um, you know, they can show um, how they're um, interpreting the trends and using the trends. Um, but, you know, we need to teach them the history of design. So we can use color, um, you know, we could pick up on, say, the green that's in the the color trend for this year. Um, and we could use the color um, to scaffold the learning, kind of like a thread through history. So, you know, we could make sure that they understand, you know, that a Georgian green is very different from a Federation green, which is very different from Art Deco green, and different from Bauhaus, as you mentioned. Um, so, you know, get inspiration from the past, but understand, you know, how color is very specific to an era. And they do have, um, you know, an assessment brief that is to do a period interior, so they need to really get that right. But, you know, how can they then, from their knowledge of, of you know, historical eras, so that they understand the context of where, you know, current trends inspiration is coming from? And, you know, to make sure that, you know, then, you know, for so some of their projects, they're interpreting, um, you know, a uh, historical era in a fresh way and, and using the color trends um, that are current. Um, so history is really important. Um, getting our students, our students have been here, which was fantastic. We really appreciate that. Um, and so getting to use current product and current colors, um, as well as history. And then sort of the third pillar or aspect of color would be what we call subjectivity, which is a bit like what you're talking about with individual clients. You know, what color um, speaks to them? What color do they um, love and want to bring in um, to a room so that it's subjectively <clears throat> their own? that we're not just, we're getting the students to understand the importance of working with a client. And um, we call that subjective placemaking, and color is a big part of that. So in public places, how can um, certain groups who have an identity, how can their colors be brought into public space? Or maybe where they're gathering, how can you know, that group, how can color be used um, to help generate their group identity. And then, of course, um, we teach our students, you know, for commercial projects, how important it is to, um, to you know, start with the brand of a company and incorporate <clears throat> some color from their brand, which is, you know, branding um, the environment. Um, and something to consider is, digital environment as well as physical. So more and more there's a digital environment aspect to the project. So, you know, what happens in the physical environment with color 
as, say, paint on the wall or um, a tile or upholstery or fabrics, then what, how can that be um, come through in a digital environment? So augment, layers of augmentation or fully digital environment. Um, so we get them to consider both realms. And also, um, speaking of digital environments, historical eras are very important. So if we are looking at, say, gaming as an influence, you know, a lot of games are set, say, in the 1920s or so. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, you kind of like set design. You're, um, you know, you're bringing in the right colors and materials um, for the digital area as well. You have such a strong Australian accent. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm wondering, also, with a um, Brazilian background here, to come to Australia, it's interesting to understand your take on, I mean, however long you've been here, I'm just bringing that in, to be able to interpret how um, the Australian voice of colour is perceived. And the second part of my question is we're also dealing with, and I know because I deal with a lot of design students as well, that um, a lot of them have very a range of multiculturally different backgrounds, and I, I think that must be an amazing process to unlock when you're dealing with colours from um, an Indian background that has such a strong use of of the those sort of spice market colours, if you like, the the creams and the burgundies, and then um, if I want to be, you know, you're Greek, so blue and white looks fantastic on the Mediterranean, but doesn't work on a house in the northern beaches. Um, it's interesting to see how culture brings in um, their opinion of colours to be appropriate to a market that they're then living in. Yeah, we have a relationship with um, a school in India called Pearl Academy, and so it's been fun to have um, Indian students online um, in our classes, and then they come to do their final year with us here. And so it's been interesting. Yeah, the cultural differences—they're much more willing and excited about using color. Um, I mean, we did find, you know, internationally that we've all, we've been in this white and gray era um, internationally and popular in Australia as well. So, you know, we don't want to panic and these students have to redo all their projects, but, you know, I mean, that's a fantastic um, approach as well. But, you know, we want to now make sure that they've starting to use color more and there's some hesitation in with our students to use color because i think they see these fantastic projects that are you know the cool grays or 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 all whites and beautiful white kitchens and such and so they want to do that but also then they've never had to deal with color because the it's been popular not to use color so um yeah we're trying to get them to be a bit more brave and so with the indian students we do see some difference. But I think that, um, you know, it's really important to understand the light and the atmospheres of Australia, the historical colors, you know, of Australia, say from Federation style, how that differs from, you know, arts and crafts in, say, England or the US. Um, and so I think um, as far as bringing in Australian colors and materials, it's just being here and being um, getting our, you know, our students are here, and you know they are learning from Australian designers, so they're they're all very Australian in their influences. Yeah. When we, when we, I'm a twin. If I say we, I'm not schizophrenic. When we were growing up, we were young. There was a term that was mental health that I don't think that I ever heard, um, and obviously that term has existed forever. It's how we deal with the situations we're in and how they affect us. Um, I've got now an 18 and 19 year old and I watch how they deal with social media and the anxiety and the expectation that is thrown through image after image is quite overwhelming. And me in high school in the 80s didn't have to deal with any of that, even though we still had the cool kids and what we thought was right and all of those, th those influences. I'm wondering how you deal with that because the, the, the creativity of healthy interiors is important from a sustainability point of view, but colour has a huge influence on how they feel to be in, which can greatly affect mood. I wonder how you, I would expect that becomes part of the, the, the teaching and the ethos to students. Yeah, so, you know, our students 
um, our digital natives um, for the most part. We have um, many mature age students as well that you know have learned about computers as, as I have. But you know we have digital natives, so um, they're so used to interacting online and developing their identities and they sort of have their own PR campaigns for themselves. Um, and so we find that um, that we need to, yeah, I guess just respect where they're coming from. Some of them have had, you know, sort of hardships where, you know, you sort of are in this environment of 24 seven school, whereas maybe you were having a hard time at school and maybe a bit of bullying or something. And then at least when you're home, you're like, okay, that's done until tomorrow. But now it just keeps going, going, going in your bedrooms and on your phone and with you all the time. So we, you know, through, through ref referring to some students, to counseling and such, we sort of can tell them, look, you know, this is sort of a new opportunity, this is a new start, you know, for you and maybe to move away from some of those problems from high school. Um, and we're very much online as a uni, so, you know, all the, even the face-to-face -face classes, of course, have the online learning platforms. But how they present themselves has been interesting because it's very much glamour and tweaked and so we try to get them to understand, you know, that image is great for your friends or that image is great when you want to explore sort of growing up and being glamorous, but it's not quite professional. So, you know, don't put that one on your CV because that's, you know, that's a little bit too high glamour. So just sort of getting them to understand there's a range of identities from who they were before uni, who they are now, and then who they want to be socially, but then also you know, what persona they're creating for themselves professionally. If they're scared of colour, maybe you need a little workshop with um, Sarah Jane and Fiona and Danielle, Danielle, get you all together into the same room. I think that people get scared of colour, but also of pattern, and then they just have to maybe walk into a, a Peter Alexander pyjama shop and just be completely overwhelmed <laughs> to remember. That was like when I had something in the 1980s. Um, it, it's, it's overwhelming to see colour and pattern together. I'm trying to cover sort of many facets. There's a lot of knowledge here that we have between the five people on the room, but I also want to make time for you all to be able to have a chat and talk with everyone here. It's a mingling space. Um, Fiona, all of the details of the new colour forecast are out on website, all ready to go. Everyone can find out details. And have you got information? Is there details here that people can come and have a chat with you and talk to as well? Yeah? Your tiles, everywhere. everywhere. Gorgeous. Large formats. I think the way that real estate has changed in price, where the average price of an Australian house is just continually growing whilst the economy is slowly sort of dragging itself along, means that the budget can afford and realises value in large format tiles, which reduces all of that grout, um, but opens up opportunity. Um, I'm going to sort of start at the end there. My final wrap up, I'm morphing from doing interior design, lifestyle TV to that's I'm going to ask the important question. Are you ready? Each one of you, one by one. What colours are you using for Christmas in your home this year and why? Um, it's probably not surprising that I go down the mad Christmas theme. I don't like a theme. I like it to just be mental. So it's everything from supermarket to hand-painted to crystal. I like it all and I like it sort of maximalist. That's yeah. what happens in our house. Wonderful. Chocolate and cheese and all at once and a bit e of ham. Everything. Everything. Throw it all in. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm traditional. So traditional. I've got beautiful shades of green. Mm -hmm. um, obviously red and lots of gold, but it's done in a very tasteful manner. So I would have no doubt. Yeah. Maybe a little bit of pink. <laughs> Jason? Um, my place is usually very neutral and organic um, with the hint of colour, um, but now with my partner, Bruno, which mm. is from Brazil. Right. Um, injection of colour. So we've, we embrace colour and um, I don't think we miss out on any of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> which colours you like? We're submerged All in colour. All of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. All of them. <laughs> Dr. Scott. Okay, so every year my partner and I, we try to start out with, okay, we're just gonna be very subtle this year and not do too much. 
But as Christmas gets closer, I'm from New York, so you know I think it's got to be like the Rockefeller Christmas tree mm -hmm. coming. So um, and cut trees because that's where I guess that's sort of the northern hemisphere in me. Yeah. So there's this amazing um, company called Elf Help, just putting it out there, and they dress up like elves. They deliver the cut tree. They put it in the stand for you. Fantastic. You decorate it, and then when you're done, they come put this thing over it so needles don't go everywhere, and then they recycle the trees. So we might be calling elf help again this year. So, <laughs> so elves are real. Elves are real, and, uh, yeah, and they, uh, they wow. are in Australia. So, so, and then once, once we sort of start with that, then we're pretty traditional. And so green and red and gold and silver and lots of... They sort ornaments. of seem to always work. Yeah. But we always try every year not to go that way, but can't help it. <laughs> Ends up. Daniela. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. No, red, red. And, um, I don't think I'm going to do red. But mm -hmm. I'm more in the nutmegs, the shades of pinks, lots of gold. I love gold. Um, I'm really excited about New Year's even more because I'm doing a Palm Spring party. Stop that it. That is a lot of color. So Stop I'm probably it. more excited about that. <laughs> I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic. In 2000 and... Let's skip Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I think it was, it was 19. We dragged the children, our children from Los Angeles to San Francisco, the, the Disneyland and Universal Studios, so we could drag them into the desert of California and look at mid-modern architecture for three days until their eyes bled. And then we pulled up out the front of a house and I got completely emotional. And Francesca, our daughter, said, OMG, you're crying over another bloody house. I said, that no, is the no. Brady Bunch house, and it changed my life. <laughs> as far as colour, I think we've sort of done a little bit of a full circle, and I think uh, I've just recently done a renovation with a very strong Palm Springs take, and we've got a new Taubman's colour called U Minus Springs, because I've transformed U Minor into Palm Springs. I guess. Very, yeah, that colour's being used everywhere now for decorations. I hope that you, sitting back listening and being calm and, and, and hearing some colour inspiration and idea, the way that each of these experts are understanding colour and use it in their different fields. I also want to thank our amazing hosts, Kaylin Tiles, for an amazing venue. I still think that you should hire this out at night for a club. I remember when I first walked in, and of course, to Torbmans for an utterly inspiring colour, inspiration. Um, the journey's exciting. It's beautiful to see the new colours through. I look forward to using them in 24. I know that they're already out. Um, it's a great uh, inspiration. To the five of my guests, thank you so much for being part of this event. You're gonna be mingling. Sarah Jane Pike, Fiona Dawson, Jason Misford. Dr. Scott Skipworth and Della Tippett, Daniela Tippett, thank you so much. Each of you are utterly inspiring. I want you all to uh, also clap yourselves. Thank you for being here. You've driven across the city in craziness. As we start to close the doors on 2023, we need to realise that all of us are in a very similar state. I speak to design students, to clients, and to fellow designers, and I've got some good friends in the room. It's been overwhelming. It can be take over our lives, transforming spaces. It's important to come to events like this to be recharged and be reminded what we do and the power that we have to transform space through colour, through our ideas and energy. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Be very kind to everyone around you, but most importantly, be kind to yourself. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. It, uh, it was a great uh, discussion. I think we all enjoyed and now uh, we all inspired to color. Um, uh, it was a long discussion, so apologies for those who, who were standing. I hope it was worth it and you will all enjoy with, with, uh, with the cocktail here at bar. Um, obviously, I would like to thank our team that prepared this whole showroom uh, and obviously our, our team in China that was fully working with engineers and designers understood the, the brief understood the design and understood the color. I think Fiona could, could agree with that. Um, obviously, I would like to thank all the panelists here, especially Fiona for Tobmans, but also Danny that was uh, styled this whole showroom so beautifully with all the color. 
So uh, obviously, thank you. <laughs> so uh, please join us at the bar. Uh, Fiona will be at uh, at uh, oh, in that part of the session with a flat lace, so you can actually tag at Kaylin Tiles or at Dobmans, and you'll be able to win a color Smith Reader. Uh, and Fiona will be there to assist you with with, with that. Um, something very exciting I would like to announce uh, today. Uh, which is actually for the next year, we'll be working on a new collaboration with a real superstar of, uh, of Australian design, Greg Natali. Welcome, Greg Natali. It's, it's, it's going to be an amazing collaboration. We're really looking forward to it. I don't think we could feel too much, but it's really something that you may not even expect from Greg and definitely not something you will expect from Porcelain Tile. So stay tuned and hope to see you all soon next year. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you all. Oh, just, just uh, one quick moment. Um, Sarah Jane just would like to say a couple I'm of words. I promise we won't take too much time. I'm going to be super, super quick. Um, I'm going to put on my other hat, which is as the New South Wales Chair of the Design Institute of Australia. And at the moment, um, interior designers, what we're doing in the Design Institute of Australia is fighting for our right to be recognised under new legislation coming in in New South Wales. We should all know about the Design Building Practitioners Act from which we have been excluded. And as an industry, we need to fight. We need to be up there because we're going to disappear. So we're fighting for the recognition of the term interior designer, for accreditation across the industry so that we can then go to the government. They've said to us, you're not regulated. We need to self-regulate. And that's what the Design Institute is working very, very hard on. And what we need from everyone is to be aware, to know what's going on, to talk to each other and to join the Institute so that we can have some funding to do this. It's a very, very small organisation and all of the membership fees could make a huge difference to being able to campaign um, at Parliament. We've already made a major submission to government. It's a very small group of people trying to work for everybody. It's state and it's going to be national if you want to talk to me about it. I'm super passionate about it. Come and ask me. But um, yeah, be aware. All right. Enjoy, enjoy the drinks. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed tonight. The speakers were amazing. I love coming here and meeting new people and connecting with all the different designers. Like, it's just amazing. Thank you so much for hosting. I love it. I just love it. We love it. Um, it was just a great night listening to the power of colour and all about collaborations. Thank you. 